Hello, this is Reasonable Faith Adelaide. Tonight we have Bronwyn speaking to us on the occult, which could be very interesting. There are a lot of people in our society these days who say, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. And what exactly do they mean by that? I'm not sure that that's what Bronwyn's addressing tonight, but what she does have to say will relate to that. So thanks, Bronwyn. I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, before I begin, um, there is a temptation when presenting on this topic to go into many examples of occultic type behaviour um, in order to make a point. I try to avoid this. If you want more detailed accounts, then I suggest you look at the book list, which I will reveal, where the reading these accounts is in context and therefore more helpful. So tonight's presentation uh, here at Reasonable Faith Adelaide is titled A Christian Response to the Occult and it delves deeper into understanding um, the unseen world beyond what meets the eye. I will also discuss the question of the reality of ghosts. In the Western world, ignorance is often considered bliss, uh, leading many Christians to overlook the realities of the spiritual realm dismissing demonic and supernatural activity as mere fiction. Yet in our highly scientific and secular society, many remain intrigued by spiritual and supernatural experiences in their search for purpose. The enemy's strategies are subtle, akin to guerrilla warfare, staying hidden and attacking stealthily. Uh, with the rise of post-Christian society, we witness a gradual erosion of shared values and personal responsibility, is there more at play here than mere social change? I believe so. In the movie The Matrix, Morpheus presents Neo with a choice, the blue pill for remaining in ignorance or the red pill for awakening to the reality of the unseen world. Too often we opt for the blue pill, unaware of the spiritual battle unfolding around us. In 2 Kings chapter 6, Elisha and his servant are surrounded by the enemy, causing fear to arise in the servant until Elisha prays for his eyes to be opened. He is then able to see the hills filled with the angelic realm and the servant gains a newfound sense of protection and gains awareness. This should be our aim also. So, do I print it this way? Where do I point it? There. not working. Oh, wait a minute, I'll turn it on. Is it doing it now? No. It was before. We'll try again later. Okay, so I've read quite broadly to put this topic together. And while there is a lot that um, Christians agree on, there are some areas of disagreement, mainly around the topic of deliverance, uh, which I will address. So we have the New Age cult by apologist um, Dr. Will, Dr. Walter Martin, Sense and Nonsense About Angels uh, by Bowen, Bowman, I Give You Authority by Charles Craft, Spiritual Warfare by Derek Prince, The Invisible Dimension by Matt Arnold, Unmasking the Devil by John Ramirez, Hugh Ross's book Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men and his article A Scientist Takes on Demon Possession. Online articles, The World Bulletin, A Christian Response to the Occult by Christopher Reese, um, articles on the conversation on nature, religions are growing in Australia, articles uh, on Witch Talk, The Rise of the Occult on Social Media, um, another article on the ABC, the modern, For Modern Witches, the Occult Provides Something the Church Can't, and Raquel, she's a part of a growing trend finding meaning in New Age spiritual practices. An article on Matt Arnold's Ghost Schools and Gods website called The Ghost of C.S. Lewis Appearing to J.B. Phillips. Very interesting. Premier Christianity's Opinion Blogs, two by Matt Arnold, one titled Exorcisms Are on the Rise and another titled Ghosts and What the Bible Really Says About All Things Spooky. Unbelievable podcast is um, Halloween Harmless, fun, by um, including X Age X. Healer Angela Yusi and Matt Arnold, editor of Christian Parapsychologist Journal. And the article Deliverance, the Evolution of the Doctrine by the Gospel Coalition. 
and that's an excellent article. Okay, let's try this again. Okay, great. So, my outline uh, includes a definition of the occult, uh, new age and occult practices, a biblical perspective on the occult, signs and symptoms, deliverance ministry, our Christian identity, ghosts, a biblical perspective, summary and conclusion. Okay, definition. The occult refers to the supernatural beliefs, practices and phenomena that are beyond the realm of normal human understanding and scientific explanation. I find it interesting that it comes from the Latin word occultare, which means secret or to hide. It often involves the study of hidden or mysterious um, knowledge and the practice of rituals, spells, divination and the communication with spiritual entities or forces. Uh, the occult is associated with the mystical and magical traditions that seek to uncover hidden truths or tap into spiritual energies beyond the physical world. Okay, the New Age Movement. In the West in 2024, the term the occult does not appear very often, however its practices do. The, re the revival of ancient occultism now comes under the umbrella of the New Age. Uh, which does not believe in the God of the Bible, but in God defined in many ways, uh, generally as an impersonal force pervading all creation. It is known in philosophy as pantheism, all as part of spiritual, sorry, I might not be clicking that on. Um, yeah, um, all as part of God, the only true reality is a spiritual. It has an emphasis on personal experiences and mysticism rather than dogma, a belief in monism, 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 all reality is one, or pantheon, pantheism, everything is God. Adoption of beliefs from a variety of worldviews and religions or mystical traditions, native cultural practices. Interesting. Rejection of the idea that the single religion um, of belief systems is exclusively true, the belief that humans are divine and don't need salvation but enlightenment. The belief that humans can bring about utopia through enlightenment and personal transformation. The belief in an impersonal divine mind or cosmic consciousness in which we are all eventually to be absorbed. The use of avatars or messengers who will bring knowledge of it to us. They deny the, the deity of Jesus Christ as saviour and redeemer. Okay, so how does this new age appear in the modern world? It's a new name, but the same old game. Also known as paganism, Wicca, um, na uh, native tribal practices, nature worship, and communicating with spirits. It often involves mainstream wellness activities like yoga and meditation. Various forms of spiritualism include rituals and taking of husalet uh, hallucinogenic drugs, astrology, tarot cards, seances, divination, readings, witchcraft, uh, wicca, fortune telling, Ouija boards, channeling, attempting to interact with spiritual beings, um, crystals for meditation and healing, uh, the pursuit of altered states of consciousness, sometimes called using hallucinogenic drugs. Even in Australia, with the recent concerns over the the use of the camber frog poison, which has led to deaths or was linked to spiritual ceremonies. Uh, Astra travel, um, automatic writing, telepathy, levitation, magic, necromancy, which is the communicating with the dead, water divination, contact, contactees having UFO encounters. Um, in Australia, interestingly, the latest census, there were 33,148 people who identified as pagan and affiliated with nature religions up from 15,222 in 2016, so it's doubled. Uh, an article in Religion and Ethics ABC 2022 shares how spiritual tourism is tipped to boom as travellers pursue a type of holiday, um, many opting for, for experiences uh, like to be a Hindu Buddhist monk uh, for a month. In a Masking the Devil, John Marez 
who was a former high-ranking devil worshipper and evangelist for the dark side before his conversion to Christianity. In his words, um, the enemy is out to destroy our lives. These activities are, are gateways and portholes for him to take a foothold. Okay, so um, occult practices go viral. TikTok and social media platforms like podcasts and YouTube have enabled various ideas and practices such as curses to be shared more readily. The hashtag witch talk has exploded in popularity over the last few years. The top witch talkers stream rituals and spells to spell tutorials to an audience of millions. Uh, in 2017, it was clocked um, 18.7 billion views. Uh, I find that staggering. Um, this fact in itself should give us pause to think. I wonder, do we as a church take the back foot too much? Should we in our churches be addressing this at least in our community prayer life? This is an American statistic, but um, I would suspect Australia would be similar. 21% of young Americans use crystals and tarot cards weekly. 43% uh, use it monthly. R John Ramirez points out, there is nothing innocent about these activities. Uh, take part in them and you are propping the door wide open for the enemy's activity in your life. Um, from someone who knows what they're talking about. Okay, so a biblical perspective. So what does God say? He says, indeed says a lot on numerous occasions, as in Leviticus. Do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists, for you will be defiled by them. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination, Sorry, it's not come up, yeah. Um, or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witch cast or cast spells. There you go. Or who is a medium or spiritist or who consults the dead. Is there anything new under the sun? I don't think so. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord because the, of these same detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out these nations before you. In the New Testament, in Acts, we see the account of the burning of the occultic books, said to be worth thousands of dollars, and considering they didn't have the printing press, they probably were. Um, as we can see, God does not take lightly these such practices. However, many people choose to ignore warnings about get, not getting involved in New Age practices. My friend from church recently attended a Catholic service where the priest's message was on just these things. He was warning the parishioners against involvement in tarot cards readings. Good for him. At the lunch following, my friend was my her friend, my friend's friends were dismissing the priest's warnings. Um, my friend was shocked at their complacency. I really think it comes down to people's own study of the Bible. When you read how God responds to nations involved in these practices, it gives you a deeper insight. I recall a story by Bible teacher Derek Prince who said years ago, so it would have been in the 70, 1970s or 80s, a local church, English church was having a fate. Someone invited a spiritist to the event. The pastor's wife, would you believe, went into the tent and got told she would get breast cancer and die. Unfortunately, she didn't get prayer or denounce this curse over her life and indeed died from breast cancer some time later. I expect that today Protestant churches are more vigilant. But any suspected involvement in um, or involvement or suspected curse inadvertently spoken out over our lives must be met by seeking God's forgiveness, prayer and counsel by those in our church community. And there's a lot online on prayers, blessings and curses by these authors if you would like to read them or view them. Okay, so consequences. What are the signs and um, symptoms of those who are involved in occultish practices and what do they ultimately show? Angela Yuki, 
uh, who is an American Christian, an ex-New Ager. So recently, in 2021, she turned to Christ for help. She had spent a decade as a self um, healer and astrologer. She was heavily involved in doing readings for people. She describes the new age as a spiritual narcotic, offering the illusion of peace, grandeur, power and success, and underneath people suffer from depression, anxiety, fears and nightmares, suicidal thoughts and, and ultimately death. You can hear more of her story on the, on the unbelievable podcast referenced. Um, Hugh Ross points out that in his book, um, those people, those few people who encounter what believe what they believe to be UFOs, are left feeling fear, anxiety, hysteria, recurring nightmares, insanity, and even death. It appears that residual real UFOs, in one or more ways, must be associated with demons. Uh, Ross explains that even non-Christians, would you believe? draw similar conclusions. John Kuehl, an agnostic who spent a lifetime researching UFOs, writes, demonology is not just another crackpotology. Thousands of books have been written on the subject, many authored by scholars, clergymen and scientists. Victims of demon oppression, um, sorry, victims of, de uh, of demon oppression suffer the same medical emotional symptoms as the UFO contactees. Interesting. Charles Cross points out in his book referenced, um, the devil has very little authority over other, other than that granted by him, by those who obey him or give him. Um, because of this fact, we are able to, as James stipulates, resist the devil and he will flee from you. I think Kraft makes an excellent point. So, um, just to continue on this line, while it is unwise uh, to give the devil too much credit for our own shortcomings, many Christians dismiss demonic activity in the West as stuff of fiction, and this is also dangerous, as although we may not um, be into unquestionable practices, if our lives are not reflecting the fruit of the Holy Spirit, i.e. love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, then we allow room for the wrong type of spiritual influence in our lives. 1 Peter tells us to be alert and sober, minded for your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Um, Deep-seated bitterness, unforgiveness, or anger can give Satan a foothold into our lives. The battle, as many experts put it, um, is in the mind. Here is where we must be vigilant. Another way we can lose control is through the abuse of alcohol and drugs or practices such as hypnosis or mind-emptying medication. John Ramirez um, reminds us that the tongue has the power of life and death. We must be careful to always speak faith and life into our situation. I think he has a good point. Uh, into our family's lives and those we encounter. Does this mean we can't be honest with our feelings? No, but God has always the last say and he cares for us. So I move on to deliverance ministry, a controversial topic. Currently, uh, the the rationalist-driven perspective rightly seeks to swing the pendulum away from seeing demons around every corner. But for those who are sceptical about the ministry of deliverance, it's worth remembering that Jesus and his disciples cast, regularly cast out demons. Um, I think there's over 50 accounts of um, casting out demons by Jesus and his disciples in the New Testament. In Mark, the first recorded miracle of Jesus is the exorcism of a man with an unclean spirit. Um, according to Mark, Jesus first became famous as an exorcist, which was different to the Old Testament because it never happened there. So in the 21st century, despite a downplaying of its need, it is still happening and there are different ways in which churches or ministry groups go about this. Um, in the Catholic Church, um, 
here in Australia, it must be carried out specifically by an ordained priest. The article on, this, on his ministry by F uh, Father uh, Shadbolt discusses this. He's from Melbourne, and um, that's a good read. Most church groups use ministry teams who work with counsellors and other professionals to administer to anyone needing help in this regard. It's a holistic approach. What's interesting to note is that those people in the front line of ministry who see people really suffering often see the need to practice deliverance ministry. Um, in the Church of England, St Luke's Church here in Adelaide has had a robust ministry serving people in this regard in the past, and I personally know people who were involved in this. Um, Matthew Arnold from the UK, who is involved in this uh, ministry, points out that exorcism um, is not something to be undertaken lightly or as a freak show stage event on a Saturday night to um, satiate the curious. It is the be a beautiful healing of a person and should be pastorally sensitive, dealing with any psychological and or spiritual afflictions. For safeguarding, both legally and spiritually, it should be never carried out alone. I think that is a good point. So, um, in charismatic circles, working with counsellors and um, other mental health practitioners, it's encouraged. Some churches, um, but not all, have this ministry as a part of their work. I do wonder if we will see an increased need for prayer in, this, in the community in this regard, particularly as younger people experiment with drugs and as depression, anxiety and suicide continue to rise. For a more detailed review on this, I refer you to the article below, which is a really good read by the Gospel Coalition. Um, I would like to add that the general consensus is that Christians can suffer from demonic influence in their lives, and Paul himself, when speaking to the Galatians, says, who has bewitched you? Um, I think that the subtlety... Um, Oh, he and others warn us against complacency. I think the subtlety of the enemy is much more prevalent than we are aware. Okay, so hopefully I can move on. Yes, image bearers. In all this, what does an average Christian need to remember? Charles Croft points out that unlike Satan, we bear the image of God and are made co-inheritors with Jesus of the riches of our Father God. We carry by virtue of our position the Holy Spirit within us, who has infinitely more power and authority than the whole satanic kingdom. The Christian response to all this must be one based firmly on who Jesus says we are and what he has done for us. Here I will quote from Matt Arnold in his articles from Premier Christianity. The Bible is clear about how God wants his people to view occultism practices. Should we seek these experiences? No. Should we be frightened? No. Perfect love casts out all fear. Jesus defeated the devil at the cross. People allow some of these evil spirits to affect them with dire consequences. As Christians, we're called to walk in the light of truth and with grace to highlight the dangers practicing occultism causes. The devil seeks to steal, kill and destroy Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. Um, John Ramirez stipulates, the Christian weaponry includes the name of Jesus, the word of God, the blood of Jesus, the word of our testimony, an obedient life, praise and worship, a life of prayer including spiritual gifts, finding your purpose, fasting and intercessory prayer. I would add the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. So, in all this, as Christians, we are called to be strengthened. We do have tools and arms to use, as the apostles call it, and as they say, finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armour of God so that you can stand against the tactics of the devil. For our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the, the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil 
in the heavens. In this way, uh, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. And John reminds us that little children, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Okay. We are then. To conclude this the first part of the talk, I would like to remind us that his purposes are that now through the church, that's us, the manifold wisdom of God should be known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Um, something to consider. Second Corinthians says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Sorry. Now, I'm not getting a bit funny with this. Ambassadors. This is a very interesting description of who a Christian is and it indicates more than a representative. What legal right does ambassador have? I asked ChatGBT. So, an ambassador is a diplomatic representative of a country who, officially, who is officially recognised by the government of the host country. Ambassadors have special legal standing in the host country and they are granted diplomatic immunity, which means they are protected from the jurisdiction of the host country's laws and cannot be prosecuted or sued. This immunity extends to the ambassador's residence, office and diplomatic vehicles. Ambassadors have the privilege of inviolability, meaning they cannot be arrested or detained by the host country's authorities. Additionally, ambassadors have the authority to conduct diplomatic negotiations and represent their country's interests in the host country. So if God himself, through the words of Paul, is calling us Christ's ambassadors, then we have authority and should in no way fear. So now I want to move on to the next part of my presentation, that being of ghosts. Addressing the question of their reality and the Bible's depiction of them. I haven't come across this perspective before and I thought it was worth mentioning. I'll begin with an account um, written by Will Bird in 1968 um, from his book, Ghosts Have Warm Hands. Um, in 1917, Will was wandering a battlefield looking for shelter. Two sh soldiers wave him into theirs. He falls asleep. A few hours later, he's awoken by a tug at his arm and his brother Steve Baird, uh, by, uh, and it's his brother Steve Baird. This is as strange as his brother has been reported missing, presumed dead uh, two years earlier. Will immediately asks, where have you been? And Steve doesn't respond to Will's questions, but signals for him to follow, which he does. Eventually Steve vanishes and Will thinks, I must have been dreaming. And he falls asleep among some ruins. The next morning he's awoken to shouting, only to discover that the shelter he had been in earlier had been blown up by a shell. So William Beard becomes convinced that he was, had been saved by the ghost of his brother Steve. So my possibilities, in my opinion, are that he was an angel or a vision of his brother sent by God or that it actually was his brother's ghost sent to help him. Okay. So ghosts in the Bible. While the general theological consensus is that demons and evil spirits are fallen angels, what is the biblical understanding of ghosts? Are they just demons impersonating the dead or are they actually the dead themselves? How did the early disciples view them? Interesting point. Interestingly, Jesus himself uses the term. More on that later. My research centres around that of Matt Arnold. Um, born in England in the West Midlands, he was brought up in the Baptist Church where he came to Christ and was baptised as a teenager in 1998. As an adult, he's been a lay minister in the Church of England. While he holds a degree in physics and engineering, 
He also holds a master's in pioneering ministries. He received an academic prize for his dissertation, Paranormal Hauntings and Application in Deliverance Ministry, a critical investigation. He is currently the editor of the Christian Parapsychologist Journal. Mm, interesting. Um, and has a website called Ghosts, Schools and God. His latest book, The Invisible Dimension, which I have read, uh, seeks to clarify the cultural the and theological con context of the spiritual beings. Um, the following points have, are taken from his article in Premier Christianity, noted below, and his books. So, um, most typical Christian responses, sorry, get on to the next one, um, tend to fall into two polarised camps. Uh, either rationalising the supernatural experience um, of ghosts as having been all, all in the mind or explaining it away as demonic deception. The departed, as portrayed by, um, as, uh, are portrayed as conscious when Jesus talks to Elijah and Moses at his transfiguration. While Elijah was translated and didn't die, Moses had been dead. Yet here he, he was alive and speaking with Jesus, even before Jesus rose from the dead, as the first fruits of the resurrection to come. The truth conveyed by this simple glimpse into the heavenly dimension is that the departed are not in stasis, but are active. Interesting point. Okay, are ghosts demons? One serious objection raised against ghosts is that the belief that apparitions cannot be of those of the departed and so therefore must be demonic impersonations. The two main scriptures used to reference or support this hypothesis concerning Satan appearing as an angel of light in 2 Corinthians and Saul and the medium of Endor. The uh, context of 2 Corinthians, Paul's reference to Satan masquerading as an angel of light, um, Paul is warning about the self-appointed apostles, uh, super apostles who were demanding financial support from their disciples. It is not a standalone verse written about ghosts. While impersonation of the dead may be within the repertoire of a demon, we should test the spirits um, to see whether they are from God. No test would be required if all spirits were demons. I think he makes a valid point. Okay, so. Was it really Samuel? The most famous passage uh, of scripture regarding contact with the departed is found in Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel 28, where Saul rejects God's prohibition and on necromancy, found in Leviticus, and employs a medium to summon the deceased, Samuel. Some claim this was an impersonating demon, not Samuel, but this is reading into the text what you want it to say. Instead, the text clearly states that it was Samuel who pronounced Saul's doom. He consulted a medium regarding the spirit of the dead to inquire of her. Objections. Um, to the real Samuel being summoned by the medium are at best attempts to read scripture with the prior belief that communication between living and the dead is impossible. Biblical prohibitions of initiating contact with the dead actually tell us that this is possible. Hmm. For God does not deal with absurd in absurd absurdities, <laughs> forbidding that which is impossible to perform. Interesting point. Um, so what about Jesus and his disciples? Some people experience crisis apparitions where beloved, uh, departed loved one appears to those left behind uh, uh, to bid farewell. Apparitions may appear uh, for a variety of reasons and although scripture forbids initiating contact with the dead, it endorses testing communications received from them and their fruit. Twice, um, Jesus could have informed us that ghosts do not exist. First in Matthew uh, 14, where the disciples see Jesus walking on the water and think he's a ghost. 
But when the disciples saw him on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And again in Luke, where Jesus appears to the disciples and says that he is not a ghost, on neither occasion does he take the opportunity to challenge the cultural beliefs the disciples had regarding ghosts as spirits of the dead. Nor does he chastise the disciples for their belief in ghosts in either account of this event, which he could have done. In this omission, Jesus and the writers appear to agree with the disciples that ghosts are real identities, entities. Um, by his term uh, of the use of ghosts, Jesus makes a distinction from that of the demonic. Oh, sorry, gone the wrong way. There we are. Okay, so why do they appear? Scripture promises rest for those uh, in Christ in the afterlife. However, the biblical idea of rest is not about inactivity, but the removal of that which causes us to labour. Maybe, um, as part of the communion of the saints, this includes helping in a crisis on earth, as in the case of Will Bird, or en encouragement to us to continue in our ministries. As departed C.S. Lewis appeared twice to J.B. Um, Phillips, encouraging his Bible translation work in his book Ring of Truth, a ring, yeah, uh, Phillips states that Lewis spoke words that were pertinent to Phillips' circumstances and that he was ruddier in complexion than ever, grinning all over his face um, and, as an old-fashioned saying, has it positively glowing with health. Um, Phillips didn't know about Lewis's death a few days earlier, news of it being buried in the foremost news of the time, that of the, the assassination, assassination of JFK. A week earlier, a week, a week later, Lewis appeared to Phillips again, once more with the same message. In Blind Spots in the Bible, Puzzles and Paradoxes, Adrian Plass recalls a meeting with Phillips' widow who confirmed that she witnessed his side of the conversation with Lewis. Suggestions of this being a demonic impersonation fall, fail when the fruit of Philip's resulting work are analysed. Um, with a fresh look at the Bible, there is actually biblical evidence suggesting that ghosts may exist. But for the novice, I think caution is appropriate. Okay, summary. Um, Matt has much more uh, on this in his book, if you are interested. He delves into the Jewish history um, and the contemporary meanings of words used at the time when Jesus was on earth. And in this respect, I do think it has some merit. Um, what do I personally think about this? Well, we are surrounded by a crowd of witnesses, as in Hebrews tells us. Perhaps there are rare occurrences where encouragement not initiated is allowed. People do have visions and they do see angels, which is supernatural in itself. So I can't dismiss it completely. However, the temptation for some may be to seek after these experiences, which is in, in itself a danger. The bottom line is that if anything in our lives brings fear, we bring it to Jesus, announcing his resurrection and peace on those we've, we've come across. This is the gospel we can share with others. No other faith actually has this demonstrated as explicitly as ours. Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Right, kicking off again. Thank you very much, Bronwyn. That was very interesting. Certainly, I think there'll be an interesting discussion from that. Uh, so who would like to speak first, online or locally? I've got a few points to make. Go for it. Um, I think one of the things to remember in all of this uh, I mean, there's the whole spiritual realm out there, powers and principalities, 
Satan, devil, demons, whatever. And the first and foremost thing to remember is that they are deceivers, deceiving spirits, and they will attempt, and they will attempt to uh, deceive particularly Christians who oppose them. And I came across this a few days ago. There's a um, a tarot card reading um, outlet shop uh, here in Victor Harbour. And if my, uh, you know, if you read, uh, as Bronwyn pointed out, I think it was uh, Leviticus 19, uh, that kind of thing is absolutely forbidden. You know, um, it, it's basically consulting mediums, consulting evil spirits. Yeah. So it is my habit when I pass this shop to simply put my hand against the advert and pray against uh or the, the evil of uh, tarot card readings and uh, uh, to pray that people will not be misled. Now, as I was passing, uh, I thought there was nobody else watching. Uh, the lady who does these tarot card readings, she was watching from inside the shop. She came out absolutely enraged and tried to convince me that tarot card readings were actually beneficial and good and that she was a christian uh, absolutely absurd nonsense of course yeah. the very opposite of what is true but it's just absolutely typical of the deception that occurs yeah. uh, so uh, yeah we, we had a, an interesting altercation in which uh, she tried to find out a bit more detail about me um and I'm not going to hand over that information because I know very well the first thing she would do is try and put a curse on me. Yeah. And uh, the second thing is uh, do not be scared or frightened of these people who, who try to uh, to influence people in a bad way. Uh, the God that we serve is the God to whom or Jesus has uh, has been given all power and all authority in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So we are we as Christians are we are under the blood of the Lord. Uh, we are protected by the blood of the Lord. We are protected under His power and His authority. But nevertheless, it is advisable if we're having any contact at all with uh, anything. Uh, satanic or devilish or uh, anything like that to daily first thing in the morning when you get up put on and make a point of putting on the whole armor of god because as christians if we try to uh, to counter any of this evil that's going on we will become targets of the enemy the enemy will for sure try to get at us with the what the Bible calls fiery darts, probably through personal or family relationships or whatever. Um, and we need to be on our guard against this. Uh, not a thing to be uh, scared of or anything like that, but um, you know, keep it in mind. Wear the full armour of God as described in verse 6 and, and do that consciously um, all the time. Um, we mentioned that we are ambassadors. I'd say we, uh, from in, we're more than ambassadors. We are both ambassadors and disciples and foot soldiers in the forefront of spiritual warfare. Um, not many Christians, I think, really understand that we are in spiritual warfare, whether we like it or not. Uh, and we just need to be uh, aware of what we're up against. Um, what else I was going to say? We need to be uh, conscious of the authority that we carry in the Lord, and we need to be able to wield that. And also... Um, there are two extremes to avoid. We in the Western culture tend to think, and we adopt the Western culture, that all this demonic st stuff is just uh, history. It's um, uh, misunderstandings, 
and there aren't really uh, there isn't really anything demonic or satanic going on. Uh, that's one extreme to avoid. The other extreme, of course, is uh, to see demons behind every bush, as they say. Uh, you can go overboard in the other extreme, and that's that's also uh, unhealthy. Uh, therefore, when we're dealing with deliverance ministry, um, which we might talk about in, in a bit more, um, it's... Um, what was I going to say? The, the, the deliverance ministry is, is not an easy thing to get into, and we do need the, the gift, the spiritual gift of discernment. We need to know what is actually demonic and what is maybe just physical illness or, yeah. or whatever it is. Um, and that is one of the reasons why it is often recommended that people get into the deliverance ministry um, don't do it alone. Go in, in pairs. Jesus sent out the 72 in pairs. Uh, there's more chance of one of the two having the, the gift of discernment than if you go it alone. And, uh, you know, if, if we go in pairs or, or more than two um, into this kind of ministry, um, one person can be dealing directly with what's in front of them. Others uh, can be praying and others can be uh, uh, sort of uh, communicating with the Holy Spirit to, to get uh, messages of deliverance, which is, I think, really, really necessary, very important to do. Uh, I'll, I'll probably shut up at this time, but... Uh, Thanks, Gordon. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. You can come back later with some more things. <laughs> so somebody else want to speak up now on something, one of the things that were online. Um, I, I just wrote just a couple of points. Can you hear me, by the way? Yes. Yes. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, I, I, I thought the talk was extremely interesting and, uh, uh, and well-researched, and um, so... Um, uh, I learned quite a lot. Uh, I, I did, however, question a, um, a couple of things you say. Uh, in the uh, passage you quoted where um, Paul says in Galatians, who has bewitched you, um, I think it might be a little bit of a stretch to say that that was um, some sort of demonic activity. I, I think he probably was just referring to uh, the influence of ordinary people. <laughs> um and the other, but I haven't kind of looked up the word bewitched, um, but I might do that later. Um, yeah. All right. And the other point is, um, you talked about modern day ambassadors and them having diplomatic immunity. Um, I don't think uh, such a, a concept existed in the time of um, mm -hmm. the New Testament when um, uh, Paul mentions that we're ambassadors for Christ. Um, so I, I just could question, question some. Uh, would you like to make any comment on that, Bronwyn? Um, no, that's a good point. Um, but being, uh, that being said, though, um, we are um, living in another kingdom, um, the kingdom of God. <clears throat> and there is a clash of kingdoms, and we are from a different kingdom. And, yeah, so... We're bringing God's authority into mortal earth. That's how I see it. Um, so I suppose in that, I'm just trying to just encourage us that um, we're not, we don't have, we're not defenceless. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, we have backing. Um, we've got God's backing, basically. It's not us standing there. You know, uh, it's Jesus. We, we are, we're Christ ambassadors in that sense. Um, reaching out to the, the people to help and minister to them. Um, so it's not actually us, it's the Holy Spirit doing the work. So mm. um, that, you know, yeah. But no, that's a good point. I was thinking similarly to you, Kevin, on that particular subject, but thinking about it as the two of you discussed it then, um, I still agree with you, but even back then there was a significance to an ambassador. 
Um, the ambassador represented the king or whatever, of whatever that other nation was. And so he did come with some level of uh, gravitas um, or a relative authority in that sense that a normal person wouldn't. So in any context, it still has significance, even if not the same as we look at it today. Yeah, I agree with you on gravitas, but I, I question the idea of diplomatic immunity. I, I yeah, think, no. Uh, yeah. Oh, I suppose that's the, only, the only sense that would be, would be that um, you know, the devil can't take hold on us, you know, and, and it's, brought him, it's brought us back to hell or something. Because uh, you know, he, he, we belong to Christ, you know, and yeah. that's my, that's the, the take I would take from that, yeah. Oh, by the way, Brian, can you pass the uh, microphone when Bro uh, Bronwyn speaks because her volume is down. Oh, okay, yeah. Sorry, uh, Brian, just a very minor point. You kept on blaming the Gauls. I think the French would be highly offended by that. I think you meant ghouls. G -O -U -L -S. Oh. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, I've got a bit of a cold, so perhaps I'm not articulating as well as I could. <laughs> The Galatians were Gauls. Uh, I have a comment, Brian. Yeah, Trevor. Um, yes. Um, some years ago, after having uh, a fairly intense charismatic experience, I felt led to get into street ministry and was involved in a... Uh, drop-in centre in North, Lower North Adelaide. And uh, straight away, uh, the spiritual warfare became very obvious, very intense, and very relentless compared to the church environment, that which I was in before, where it was very difficult, actually, to talk about spiritual things. And what I found is, often in churches, we don't teach a lot about the spiritual mm -hmm. realm. And it was good to see Bronwyn's talk exposing all the terminology that's out there. But when you look at a lot of youth groups and churches, it's not even on their agenda to get good teaching on a lot of this matter. But when you do actual ministry with hard cases involving drugs and all the other things, you do have to know all about the warfare and the spiritual weapons. And I'll just give one personal illustration. It was a fairly dramatic one for me, but uh, a Satanist came into the shop one night and uh, first comment he made is we had a cross painted up on our ceiling and he said, oh, I see you've got the satanic symbol. And I said, what? No, it's the Christian one. He said, no, it's satanic. He arrived in the shop and saw it from his angle as an inverted cross, whereas we as Christians saw it as the cross of Jesus as we marched out on the street and did our ministry. So you had the same symbol interpreted two different ways. He then sat down with me and said, I'm a Satanist and I can light cigarettes just by concentrating on the end of them. Can you do that? And I thought, oh, here we go, uh, contest. He was wanting me to challenge me on his um, whatever. Now, I don't doubt that he may be able to do it because some people do have certain uh, powers given to them by demons. But I felt the Lord showed to me, don't tackle someone on that approach give a christian witness so i said to him i i am not going to do it and i can't do it but i can talk to you about the holy spirit and he said what's the holy spirit and i said the holy spirit is the fruit of love joy peace and when i said the word peace he gives this almighty scream and convulses on the chair and i said what's the problem he said when you said that word to me it was like a sword going into my guts and it really, really hurt. And I said, well, I'm just sharing a Christian testimony. And it demonstrated to me, don't underestimate the power of the truth that we have as Christians. I'll say a bit of something now. Uh, the section you did on ghosts, particularly with the um, quotes one ever from that book that you were talking about. Um, there's some, definitely some interesting things in there to think about, but some other bits I thought was really drawing a long bow. 
I can't remember the details now, but I think he was taking things a little bit too far, um, having been caught up just in that line of thinking for a long time. I'm sorry, I didn't actually see your connection there, uh, Brian. Can you re-explain that? Uh, Bronwyn did a reasonably large section on ghosts towards the end in which she had a number of quotes or references to uh, the work of uh, Matt, somebody was it? Matt Arnold and his book. And he had a lot of items in that which some of them I thought definitely were worth uh, further consideration, were quite interesting. Um, but there were a lot of them that I thought was really drawing a long bow um, in the oh, okay. presentation thereof. Yeah. One, one thing I have observed is uh, interest in a cult. Although, um, uh, this can actually be a distraction uh, from Christianity because like, people are seeking an experience of the supernatural in their lives. And so they believe they find it in the occult. And therefore, this uh, kind of drives them away from Christianity because they may not feel um, that same sort of supernatural experience. Got any comment on that, Bronwyn? Yes, I think that's a concern because um, as Christians, we do walk a supernatural life, really. Um, we're asking, we're, we're talking to a supernatural God and... We, uh, you know, we are expecting him to work in our lives and to change us um, and to see little miracles. So I think testimonies on, you know, how God has changed us and helped us and healed us um, can answer that. But, I, yeah, I agree that um, perhaps churches need to be more proactive in, in our prayer life and seeing more things happening um, that so people are more aware of it. I don't know, it's, it's a challenge because um, yeah, people are attracted to the supernatural. Um, it's probably more on television now than ever has before, you know, um, on supernatural stuff. And it's becoming just so commonplace. Um, yeah, um, but in a mix that, you know, we serve a supernatural God who does miracles and does um, care for us on a daily basis. So um, our lives may, you know, they're extraordinarily ordinary, but they are. We do have um, the witness of God, uh, God's work in our lives um, to share and perhaps the church needs to be more um, open about that to help um, others see it but perhaps it's a personal one-on-one -on -one thing um this the new age a lot of the new age seems very um like a, we, we are such a, a society with so many different religions now and a lot of them to me were similar to what the new age philosophy was you know especially hinduism buddhism um but the fact that they really don't offer any um uh, well, no truth in the sense that um, the, our fallen nature, they don't admit the, the fact that we are, you know, we, that we have problems in our lives, you know, um, that we need God to redeem us from, you know. Um, yeah, I'm waffling now, but yeah, I, I just see, I see a, lot of, um, a lot of New Age stuff in a lot of the alternative religions that are coming now and also dare I say, in a lot of nature religions or uh, traditional uh, native religions that we have around the world. Mm. Yeah. It, it does mention in the uh, New Testament somewhere that uh, demonic uh, spirits have the ability to perform signs and wonders, wonders and will deceive many. Mm. And so that may be one way in which the occult works. At one point early on, you quoted inadvertently from the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, very often these days, Christianity is derided and looked down on as being old hat, 
Uh, you've got to get up with the times and be modern. And these people who want to be up with the times and modern go in for things like tarot cards and crystals and all these sorts of things. And yet, none of it is in any way new. It's just rehashing old stuff over and over. Uh, so if there's a problem with Christianity being old, then there's a problem with these things being old. If these things are okay, then for that particular reason, then Christianity should be well and truly listened to as well. I, I, I was thinking about the numbers that you gave regarding the number of views that these kind of topics have in TikTok, for example, social networks. Uh, nowadays, they have billions and billions of views. One of the particular ones that I have seen around is this concept of the law of attraction. Sometimes I think about that and I say, maybe there, there are positive and negative things um, about them. For example, they say, um, at least they recognize that there is something outside the natural realm, something mm. that they call the universe or something that conspires for you to achieve your goals. So it recognizes that there is something outside the materialistic side of things. Uh, and then it also may touch on the occult, as in uh, trying to seek something outside the natural world. But then there is two possible ways that you can go with that. Could be probably God is behind the scenes helping you, probably using some mechanisms but then also could lead to the denial of God. Like there is no God, it's just the universe or something like that. So yeah, I think that is taking quite of um, a big role nowadays. I just wanted to know um, if you will, if you had additional comments on that regard. On the fact that um, people are acknowledging the supernatural in a sense. Yeah, well, yeah. I, you can use that as an avenue because they often think Christians uh, don't believe in the supernatural, but we can actually say, well, we do. Yeah. Um, uh, so you can come in on that angle. But yeah, um, I no, I agree with you. I think that is a good thing to look at to say that uh, from a Christian point of view, we are, um, when you believe in the Bible, you're believing in a supernatural God. Um, so... You know, we do believe in the, an unseen world. Um, so we have that in common with them. Yeah, but I suppose I would talk about the fact that um, there are two opposing forces uh, that the Bible's clear on, um, good and evil, and, um, and anything opposed to God is in the evil basket. basket. So um, mm -hmm. and like we've intimated earlier, um, the deception and the lying um, that can come out of some of their these practices or, or trying to attempt people um, but ultimately they end up um, with a fruit in their life is depression and um, anxiety and worse so um, it's not joy love peace um, that you know the christianity can offer mm. yeah I, that's I what you mentioned there like and the, ultimately what they end up feeling sometimes is disillusion as yes in, we're yeah. having all these expectations that things were going to be perfect and then when reality comes then yeah the adverse effects come as you mentioned that's right yeah mm. hey, Giordani. Think, uh, uh, yeah can i just uh yeah i think one of the things that Giordani was inferring is that if the occultish experiences are genuine then at least this does show that there's a spiritual realm which the atheist or the naturalist cannot explain. So, um, yeah, um, so it's a, a denial of um, uh, saying that the physical world is all that there is. And so it does actually have a positive side to it. Is that what you were inferring, Jordani? Yeah, and I believe she, um, she also mentioned that at least we have something in common. So I was looking into what perspective could that have as in, Having something in common can be the start of something bigger, as in yeah. we can probably get our foot in the door, as in to be able to talk about these things yeah. a bit easier. Yeah, well put. Yeah.
Jordani, you mentioned the this new age concept of the law of attractions, which ex-Satanists themselves admit is part of what they do. It's part of their, their deceptive uh, web that they spin to try and draw people in. Um, but I think one of the other things, uh, one of the most successful things that the devil does is convince people that there's no such thing as the devil. And he's been quite successful in many denominations in the church, which really teach nothing about uh, deliverance ministries or anything like that, or, you know, how to deal with, uh, with the occult or anything like that. Um, and yet, you know, a third of, of all the ministry that Jesus did on the earth was casting out demons. And if you look at something like I think, uh, Matthew 10, uh, 7 and 8, uh, there's a list of five things there that Jesus expects uh, Christian disciples to do, one of which is casting out demons, and the other one is um, is purifying the unclean. Actually, they, they talk about their purifying the, the lepers. Well, we don't have lepers nowadays, but the lepers used to go about, they were forced to uh, uh, shout that, that, that they were unclean in that society. And the emphasis is not on the lepers, the emphasis is on the cleansing. And cleansing people of that which is unclean in their lives may or may not involve the occult or anything like that. But we have to bear it in mind that um, the deliverance ministry, which is not everybody's cup of tea, uh, but it needs to be in each church, there needs to be that potential ministry there. And it's one or one and a half of the five things that Jesus explicitly expects of his disciples. So we should take that seriously. If I may say, there's some comment that the young people don't hear much about occult ministries, or occult, etc. I recall back to the 70s, and I may have quoted him before, Bob Larson was a guy with you know, usually come in tapes, etc. And he had an interesting experience. I'll just allude to some of them. He first was called to recognize the power of evil when he went past, I think he was in Southeast Asia somewhere, walked past a Hindu temple with gargoyles, with bulging eyes, sort of uh, on the side of the temple. And he came around to the front of the temple and then he saw a group of people walking out and each of them had bulging eyes as though they were imitating or somehow supernaturally having this physical uh, dimension appearance of what were on those gargoyles. But now I just want to jump a little bit in because it was a book I read, which is where I got this from, but uh, he gave about 10 different examples of his um, case studies, shall I call it. And in one instance, he prayed in the name of Jesus, this woman who'd been self-harming, that he, this, he asked the spirit to name himself, and the spirit said, you have no authority over me. And when he inquired a bit further, the woman's, he, he found that the woman's husband, who he wanted to bring into this, was Jewish. And so much against the woman's better judgment, he asked her to bring him in. Now, this particular guy was certainly apparently a fairly nasty character, but when uh, Bob Larson explained to him what it was, he said in Yiddish, the Yiddish word for a demon. And so even though he's Jewish, he understood what this was. But then Bob Larson was asked not to pray to deliverance in the name of the Lord, but to get this Jewish man to pray as a son of Abraham and as husband of this wife, I command you to leave him. And so on the authority, both as the son of Abraham, but also as the husband of the wife, that demon obeyed and left that woman. So it was an interesting contrast of the way that uh, there are different powers and a son of Abraham and a husband does have authority in some ways that a demon will recognise. Uh, and I found that particular account, that case study, was something that challenged my mind of, of how it might happen. And I think when it comes to encounters like that, the demons will 
try to deceive us. And that, that, that statement that you don't have authority is a lie. We can go right back to the, quote the right verses from Scripture to say, yes, we do have that uh, authority devolved to us through Jesus, who has all authority. Uh, so they, they will try to deceive us, but we can stand firm in what scripture actually says. On a slightly different subject, uh, possibly the main reason that people get involved in the occult in its various forms these days is a search for power. Um, they are offered power and they find that attractive and they get involved in it that way. Um, one story I read in a book a few years back uh, was about a group of shaman, for want of a better word, African witch doctors in Africa who were getting together uh, and they were performing a ceremony. They had this great bonfire and they were performing the ceremony around it to call up the devil. And they did their ceremony and the devil came up in the bonfire. And then they asked him, why is it we have no power over these people who call on Jesus? And the devil suddenly vanished. They looked at each other and were a bit confused. So they did their ceremony again and called up the devil and the devil came again. And they asked him again, why is it that we seem to have no power over these people who, who are Christians who call on the name of Jesus? And the devil vanished again. And so a third time they did their ceremony and the devil came up and he said, don't ever mention that name again. Um, and so they got to thinking about that, right? The devil is real, we know it. He has power, we know it. But obviously this Jesus, whoever he is, has got more power. And so the one who was telling the story um, ended up becoming a Christian and seeking after Christianity because he found where the real power is. Um, the difference is that in the occult, we are offered power, whereas in Christianity, we are told that it is God that has the power and that we are to empty ourselves to be as Jesus was and give ourselves to him. But in him is the real power, in him is the life. Whereas in the devil, you end up with death. That reminds me of um, in the Garden of Eden that God gave uh, Adam and Eve an instruction, do not eat from this fruit. And then the devil tempted them with that. Like, if you eat this fruit, you will have the power of God. So basically, it's more or less a similar situation. I've got a bit of an interesting um, story uh, of what's happened to someone that's quite close to me, which um, I, I, I could probably share, which is related. Um, I Well, I won't mention who it was, but I know somebody that's close to me um, who, when I was doing my undergraduate, uh, she was my neighbour. Um, and she was a Christian growing up, but she had kind of walked away from that life um, during her late high school and university years. Uh, so anyway, um, she was uh, very against Christianity. She thought that Christians were quite foolish and and all the rest um anyway so apparently one night uh or one morning she had um a very supernatural experience where she was lying on her bed and there was a a figure that was um i mean it wasn't right but it was as probably as close to it as you can get it was uh, she, uh he was sort of holding her on the bed and she couldn't move um and then she sort of you know uh, i mean having grown up christian she sort of said you know in the name of jesus get off me and then i think you know the, the sort of the episode came to an end anyway it affected her so much and, and she she was very um agnostic or atheistic at the time um it spooked her out so much that she didn't go back in that house and she ended up actually um coming to live in the, in the house that I was in and and I offered to go live in the other house um, because she just she just couldn't face going back into the room again um so 
and and you know this is a very honest person and and it, it turned her life around and now she's a very passionate christian um so yeah so sort of from going from having walked away and and thinking that christians were very very foolish to having this uh yeah and you know there's there's a lot of people that I would be very skeptical when I hear these sorts of things but this person was very straight cut um so anyway so I just thought I'd sort of share that and and you know often I like I mean I've never had any experiences remotely you know, I'm very similar to Kevin in that way is that we kind of um we don't we don't really experience too many of those things on our day-to-day -day life as as a lot of people seem to experience but um yeah this is one one person's testimony that I'm I'm very close with and um and that it shook her big time yeah so I just thought I'd share that it's not just for other people a long way away and a long time ago it's for people here and now today mm. and you reminded me of a story too from someone I know very well that I'm reasonably close to um when she was younger she was involved with a couple of other close friends and they also seeking after power and they got involved in witchcraft and they're working their way through the levels of witchcraft growing in power and all that goes with that um, this person that I know had a mother uh, who prayed for her constantly and through one thing or another um, she ended up becoming a Christian and uh, gave up her witchcraft uh, again there was a lot of prayer involved there were demons involved and so on that sort of thing um, the other two um, also decided they wanted to get out of witchcraft the, there were problems where they weren't too sure about it um, but apparently there were curses put on them uh, by the witch's coven um, the person I know was not affected because uh, she was a Christian she was protected by God but of the other two uh, one of them ended up murdering the other in a uh, ritualistic manner um, he spent many years in prison and um, there was power involved and they were not under the power of God the greater power and so they were under the power of death that killed I think the uh, the, the whole attraction of having power is is it's a sinful but it's also the big pull towards the occult um, and by contrast in Christianity we ourselves do not have any power or any authority all the power and all the authority we have is from the Lord it is devolved to us temporarily from Jesus via the Holy Spirit and we need to uh, to recognize that and acknowledge that uh, because uh, our God is a jealous God. He is the one with the authority and the power, and we should give him all the glory and all, you know, all the praise when we actually have success in drawing people out of the occult. And I think that's another thing. Uh, the, they would have you believe that once you're in deeply into the occult, there's no escape. That, again, is another of Satan's lies they can be saved they can be turned around and there are cases where that has happened and we should uh, recognize that although they're all tied up with all sorts of horrible satanic things uh, yeah. that nevertheless god does love them and god can still even in those circumstances still save them and uh, we can and probably should be instrumental in that ministry Anyone else online have something more to say? Um, I, I just um, question what Joshua said about me about my skepticism. Um, I'm not <laughs> skeptical. <laughs> I'm not. Sorry, skeptical no, I never said about... skeptical. I never said skeptical. I said, I said, um, uh, and we've had this conversation in the past where where you've said to me that you think God um, reveals things to other people um, in ways that He doesn't reveal to you because it gives you a curious mind. You've said that to me in the past. That's what I was more oh. referring to. I feel a lot better now. Mm. It wasn't wasn't to do with skepticism. Yeah. Just just to clarify, yeah, yeah. for for the record. Yeah. I took it as meaning your yeah, experience yeah. rather than your um, skepticism from what Joshua said. Yeah, well, it will be true that uh, I haven't had any direct uh, experience of that. Oh no, um, 
I do have a friend who says they've seen ghosts. And um, I don't actually have any reason to disbelieve it. So... So what, so what I was saying was that I'm in a similar boat to you where we, we kind of know people that have these testimonies, but we don't have those testimonies ourselves. That's, That'd be true, yeah. Yeah, that, that was that was my, my point that I was making there. You know, I Kevin's boat is Joshua. a big one at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Forgiveness accepted. <laughs> right. Anything more related to the topic? Um, I think Gordon's point earlier about the sending out in pairs is important because with pairs you get accountability. If you're just doing it on your own, you can make all sorts of claims, but it's not accountable. So accountability is important. The other one is um, my uh, wife and I have had experience with different ministries over the years, and there are people who seem to have a gift of it's discernment, but they also can sort of see things in the spirit. They're not analysing everything in a, in a natural way or a scientific way. They're actually picking up on something that's a, uh, a dimension, you might say, that is spiritual. And uh, some of them uh, claim to have seen demons and see them moving around and uh, also um, picking up on signs. For example, there was a while back in our church where tapes were being wrapped around poles near the church and stuff being done. And it turns out that some of the covens were taping curses and wrapping the curses on um, spool tapes and trying to get an influence onto the property. So it's important with our properties and with church property in particular that you keep a clean site, make sure you're watching for things. Uh, witches love to put hexed items like crushed snails. They use that a lot as a, a hexing principle. Uh, the laying of sticks in a certain pattern is practiced by some of them. So there's little subtle things where they're trying to get a toehold on a property as well as in our lives. And it's not just the properties. It's also the churches themselves. Uh, they will uh, tend to lay curses to try and uh, to bring disrepute to a church, for example. That's one of their strategies. And they and they have regional and uh, sort of district and aerial strategies and a hierarchy of people to, to try and mark out territory um, uh, for their activities, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, we need to be a little bit aware of uh, what they're up to. And, and pray against it uh, in the knowledge that uh, the one <laughs> that we pray to is far stronger than all this demonic stuff. Yeah, something both Gordon and Bronwyn said earlier was about um, not looking for demons behind every bush or under every rock. And there have been Christians who have done that, and that is definitely a mistake. Um, mm. But as Charles Craft pointed out in his book, we also do need to be aware of the rocks that do have demons on them and the bushes that do have demons behind them so that we do respond appropriately to those. Mm. Yep. Figuratively speaking. <laughs> yeah, the um, <clears throat> topic of blessing and curses um, is interesting one. Um, when Jesus cursed the fig tree, um, I find that fascinating that he actually did it himself. But um, I mention him quite a bit because I've read a lot of, listened to a lot of his stuff. Um, but Derek Prince uh, spoke about a time when he was in a church in America, and right next door to the church was a, a um, <clears throat> house of disrepute, you could say. Um, and it seemed, and it was getting growing and getting bigger. And one night, at, <clears throat> he wasn't planning to, but one night at a prayer meeting, he felt led to curse the the building next door. So he, you know, in the prayer, they just cursed the building. Um, and, uh, and anyway, the next night, um, it burnt down. <laughs> And he got rung up by one of his parishioners saying that 
the church is on fire, but he, when he got down there, it was the, the building next door. And he says how uh, from that point on, he thought he had to be very careful about what he says. <laughs> but I just thought that was, yeah, <clears throat> you think, oh, well, Christians shouldn't do that. But then Jesus himself did it. So you sort of think, well, it's not exactly something I would practice. But um, uh, it, just, it just demonstrates the power of your, of your mouth. And I think as parents and oh, like myself as a teacher, be very careful what you speak over people's lives, you know. Um, the Bible does say that in the power of the tongue there is life and death. And I think it's more than just literal, um, just saying nice things. I think there actually is um, something in it. You know, so um, I'm, I'm very careful about what I say over children, even when I can get very tempted to say the wrong thing. Um, <laughs> take a deep breath. But yeah, in our own personal lives, um, it's very easy. You slip into the, you know, oh, gee, I hate my foot because it's always giving me pain, stuff like that. You can speak things over yourself, um, which uh, can inadvertently bring uh, problems. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting area if you don't want to get too hurt, um, worked up into it, but um, yeah, okay. Even if there is nothing in that, and I do believe there is something in that, uh, but even if there is nothing in that, uh, saying the positive things is always going to make you feel better than saying the negative things. And so whether you believe in it or not, it's still good advice to take. I can't remember the name of the, the, the book. Uh, it's called Blessing or Curse, You Choose. Uh, the, the book on my bookshelf. Um, so, yes, yeah, the power of the mouth is significant, for sure. Anything else tonight? Well, we might draw it to a close then. Uh, thank you very much, Bronwyn, as well as all the stuff that you shared with us. It's provoked quite a conversation afterwards. Uh, so that also makes it very worthwhile. So thank you very much. And thank you, everybody who has contributed. Thank you.